you all know how important I have already shared with you. And if this is your first time, allow me to just say, the devotional is the jam. We, we want to start all things with being centered from a centered place. Because here's the thing, whether we have a conscious awareness of it, there are things that cannot happen from a centered place. And there are things that can only happen from a centered place. So there's some stuff that isn't included in that, and it is largely caused by our unevenness, our unsettledness, our, our baggage that we've carried from last and past moments into the now unnecessarily. If that doesn't make sense, I need you to just trust me and include a devotional period, a sense of centeredness and quietness. Ours is brief intentionally because often some of us have, have uh, spiritual practices that are more extensive, and that's a good thing. But what I want you to get is that it doesn't have to be. There is tremendous benefit from a five-minute silence and an opportunity for each of us to listen, to not just hear, to listen, to tune into the divine. And so we've just shared a devotional period. Now, here's what I know is that sometime if you're especially, you know, I know mind wa minds wander even in the room, but I'm not going to talk to y'all right now. I'm going to talk to y'all at home where you think this is a moment to go refresh the coffee. <laughs> or just, I'm going to run to the back. We're just going to set it up in a way that the devotional gets a priority just for drill just for drill, just so that you can see how this thing can really work. Yes. Because why? We are on an adventure in faith. And this is not like an announcement for this moment. It's not like it's just starting. There's no one of our maturity who doesn't already know that this has to be an adventure in faith the way that life is going, the way the world is unfolding, all that we sense, the quality of our prayers reveal to us our knowing that this is an adventure in faith. And I've come today to say that we have a certain responsibility for understanding it, not calling it what I call it and seeing it in the way that I see it, responding to it as if you know who you are. I need you to hear me, though. Because in your own interpretation, you might hear me say, act as if you know whose you are. So that you can have a different relationship with life. So that you can act as if you're not at the effect of life. You're not just riding a wave of whatever happens. But instead that you have a level of dominion. Divine dominion. By right of birth. None of us is special in that way. We are all equally blessed. Now, some of us know it, and we're willing to live as if it is our truth, and that's a distinction. The distinction is not, I'm blessed, you're not. The distinction is often, I'm blessed, and I know I'm blessed, and I live in the blessing, and you don't. No shade. It's a point of awareness. And that awareness, my sense is more easily realized out of a devotional period. We call it devotional. Call it what you want. But it's more easily realized, more easily engaged from a place of stillness. Everything happens in stillness. There's not a seed you plant that doesn't require the darkness and the, and the stillness. And I'm going to declare for anybody who's thinking hydroponics, I'm not talking to you about that. <laughs> I need you to just stay with me here. 
there still is a stillness that is required, yes? And that's what I'm encouraging you to seek. So today, I'm invoking a sense of the power of now. Of now. And now isn't like a place on the clock or a place on the calendar. It's an inner vibration. It's an inner sense of knowing. You know when to go and when not to go. Ecclesiastes offers it to us this way. And I'm sharing it with you from the Prashita, where it says, to everything there is a time and a time for every matter under the sun. And then it goes on to, to speak about specific circumstances. Now, when I was younger and was not tuned into a metaphysical uh, interpretation of Scripture, I really believed that there were seasons for killing, for war, because that's what it says. There's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, there's a time for war and a time for, that, to time for love and a time to, that there was that I could set up a time when that would be. My sense now is that it's saying to us that there's a time when you're going to choose that. And there's a time when it's not going to be an acceptable choice to you. The world will not determine that for you. You will be determining it for yourself and you'll be, how does life get to be the way it is? Out of what you choose. And so there's a time when you'll choose that, and there's another time. That may be the last time you'll ever choose that as long as you live. And yet there's a time that you chose it. And you live in the consequence, in the opportunity, in the outcome of that. Is this making sense? So look, verse 2 of Ecclesiastes 3 says, a time to be born, a time to die. And here's where I want to rock for a little bit. The time to plant and the time to uproot the plant. Just because we made the bed don't mean we are locked in it for life. This is a point of, of forgiveness, a point of, of an opportunity for letting go, for releasing, for moving on, Yes? It's about time, yeah? So look, this becomes so important. They're, they're, mm, I understand I'm a serial preacher, and I ain't mad about that. It's just what we're doing. So look, we have been, uh, up until now, we have been rocking and rolling with um, Revelation. And I'm not clear what we're doing here. There we go. Revelation 21 and 1. And I saw new heavens, plural. I saw new possibilities. What? Same old life, living same place, same relationships, same job, same, 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 whatever you're thinking. Ah, but I saw a new possibility. I saw, that's what that scripture is saying to us. I saw new heavens. I saw new possibilities because it's only out of the new possibilities that the new earth can be manifest. Earth is but the manifestation of what's the never. It's not the planet. It's your reality. It's your experience. It's the, the material uh, manifestation of your divine ideas. So what are you declaring? I saw, a, I saw new heavens. I saw new possibilities, and it's not just in seeing them as a glimpse, because who among us hasn't had a flash of something magnificent? The difference is whether we can be still enough to call that into our imagination so clearly, so realistically, that we cannot tell the difference between the idea of it and the manifestation itself. You'd be surprised when you awaken, when you come out of that thought to realize it ain't here yet. Because it's so, are, are y'all getting this? Because it's, have you experienced that? Okay, Suzette has. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that we were a few more people. Thank you, y'all at home <laughs> and other places. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 
you know that there are those times that you've just had a glimpse and never revisited it. What? Because sometimes it scares us, doesn't it? Sometimes it's so powerful. Sometimes it's so much what we want that you always have to kind of wipe the corner of your mouth. It's just juicy good, yes? And then it frightens us. Because there's a part of us that questions whether we're the one who can live that life. Whether we're the one who could live there. Whether we're the one who could take that trip. Who could be the one to... And so we give it up without even delving into it fully. But look, by the time you get to Revelations 21 and 5, behold, I make all things new. So I know there's some priors. I know there's some stuff in the past. There's some stuff in the present. That if we were in charge of the universe, we wouldn't allow us to move on from that. But fortunately, we're not. Fortunately, we're not. Only in our own minds are we creating the limitations and the restrictions and the punishment for whatever, the, the, for whatever it is we think we've done that keeps us out of the greater good, the greater possibility for all that we desire. So look, Ernest Holmes says in how to use the science of mind. He says, if you wish a harvest, I'm still working with this metaphor of the seed. If you wish a harvest, you must first plant. You must put the idea in creative soil. He says, shifting this over into the field of mind, we arrive at the conclusion that the idea must be accepted as an already accomplished fact. This is our work. This is why the flash of an idea is insufficient. The idea must be accepted as an already accomplished fact because the law knows no season of time. It can only operate on the concept held in it. Oh, y'all here early. We just going to hang for a little while. It's all right. It's all right, though. I'm, I'm trying to let it not be, I don't want to feel like this, but I'm okay. All right. Ernest Holmes, in another piece, says, this means that we should recognize the divine incarnation, universal in essence, but individualized in personal experience. It's up to each and every one of us because at the center of our being, the eternal Christ waits knocking at the door of our consciousness for admission. This is why that stillness that I was talking about is so important because you'll miss the knock because you won't even hear the urge to get our attention for something more. He goes on to say, there is a divine authority at the center of my being, our being as humans, each and every one. Not a special calling for those with degrees or those with bank accounts and good credit. It is for each and every one of us. And it announces itself in every act. He says, I have implicit confidence in that invisible part of me, which is my share in the God nature. It's me expressing the divine. He says, therefore, I shall not doubt nor fear, for my salvation is from on high, and the time of its appearing is when? Now. He says, today, I am interpreting that as not a day on the calendar, but in the now moment. In the moment, you know what the now moment is? It's the moment when you become aware of it. It can't be no other time. You can't know what you don't know. So if you didn't know it in that moment, if it didn't come to you, if you didn't have an opening, an awareness, a possibility for it to be, it's not on your radar. That's not a thing you can do. You can only put in the correction. You can only make a change. You can only stand in 
what you get in that moment. That's the only time you got, yes? He ends this piece by saying, I know that the Christ in me is always triumphant. I make all things new. You just have to be in alignment, in connection, open to, available to, surrender to. I know that Christ in me is one with the divine, the living one, the strong one. There is no separation, no isolation, no aloneness. There is a divine companion who walks with me and in whose light I see the light. Oh, that don't, see, that rocks me. It's that, it's that rocks my world. This notion that I am always accompanied and in whose light I see the light. You better ask somebody. In whose light I see the light. So where we want to be. <laughs> where you want to be, but in the place from which you see the light. This is our work. I know our work feels like it's the external. We got stuff to do, places to be. It's the silence. It's in the stillness of divine awareness. Also in How to Use the Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes talks about that the practitioner, and we don't mean just the licensed practitioner, anyone practicing these principles intentionally. The practitioner is always functioning in the present because that's the only place you can do the work. The sp and, you know, I'm, I'm adding to Ernest's words here. I'm just, I'm helping him out. He left before he finished this part. He says the spirit is a present reality. There's one place to stand. It's in the now awareness. And whatever you can realize in this now moment, the intention would be that you reach as high as you can into that. A new heaven, yes? yes? So in standing in that moment of awareness, whatever it is, and nobody gets to measure it for you. It's wherever you are in a given moment. In that moment of awareness, reach as far as you can. What? Because that's a tough, that's a great time. That's a powerful time. That's an energized time. That's an empowering time. Yes, that's the only moment you have. I've come today to say, do not miss that. Do not miss that time. In every individual treatment, and this is why I was coaxing y'all to get in that treatment class, and a number of you are there, and I'm glad because you got to know for yourself it's not that somebody won't pray for you or can't pray for you, but on your way to prayer, I'm wanting you to pray. I'm just saying. He says in every individual treatment, the practitioner should know, the one praying, the one practicing, should know that the action of truth is what? Immediate. It's when you know it. And you can't know it yesterday. You can't know it tomorrow in the way that I'm talking about knowing. That knowing is as it is happening. You know, it's done. What? Come on, help me out. As we believe. It's in the as. Come on, Stevie Wonder. It's in that. And it's in that part of it. Yes. It's in that moment. As. He says that everything in the nature of time as we understand it is eliminated. Don't worry about time, the, the calendar, the clock. Every treatment must incorporate a consciousness of completion, of perfection, and fulfillment here and now. There's a part of me that feels like I could just stand here and say, it's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. And it's not on the clock. It's not on the calendar. It's in your sensibilities. It's in your knowing the truth. See, it's not time if you don't know who you are. It's not time if you don't know whose you are. 
This its time is associated with the truth of your being. It's time for you to act like you're divine. It's time for you to act like you know the truth of your being. But you see, you can't find that on a clock or a calendar. There's not like a day for you to awaken. There's a divine knowing that if you're willing to be still enough, you'll hear it, you'll feel it, you'll sense it. And your response to that will be to lean into the time, into the moment, into the power of now. <laughs> and I saw new heavens. That will then make sense to you. You know, sometimes in my, um, oh Lord, let's see, I've been in licensed ministry, formally that is, not just speaking, from the pulpit for almost 20 years now. And, uh, oh, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, and what often surprises me is how Scripture changes for me. It, I came to understand why Bible and other sacred text last forever. Because as we shift, they are written in a way where we read them with new eyes. Where we embrace it from a new heart. Because even I saw new heavens and new earth and a little bit of it. It was just, oh, okay. You know, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. But but I didn't have a sense that I'm forever doing that. That the new heaven is the divine possibility, whatever one I can catch. And sitting in a room or wh whomever you're sitting with, the, the role isn't that you're supposed to catch the same heaven with somebody else. I mean, hmm. get your own. <laughs> I'm mad at you for boot up and all that, but this ain't that. This is your own heaven. What is it for you? What's the divine idea on your life? Because out of that awareness, the manifestation, the new earth. Earth is but a demonstration and effect. What we have now is based on how we think and how we be. This is why this work is so important to me. Because I know that we're not going to change it by moving stuff around. In the upcoming election, vote. But do not count on that for changing the world. You, you got to fork your tongue sometime. Vote. Do not go not voting. You might have to ask spirit how to vote. Because some of the... St mm -mm. I'm just... You, mm. But you got to tap in. You got to be, if you're going to be in the world, you're going to have to be in the world. Come on now. And simultaneously know what's yours to be and do. And it's for you to know something, to believe something, to sense something, to see a new heaven. There's nobody we're going to elect that's going to get you the new heaven, the new earth out of that divine idea. Because there's nobody running for nothing that I've heard really... Ex no, now I've now started meddling. Okay, let me, let me go on back. They're, they're divine ideas, and I know folks are sharing them. But the point is for you to do yours. That's what the point is. And this notion that the sea was no more is that that eliminates the confusion. Metaphysically, the sea is always, well, you know what that is. The sea, it looks confused. It looks like a lot of turbulence. And that eases away in those moments when you're clear about the truth of your being. You no longer are at the effect of the world's sense of who you are and what you ought to be and be doing. So look, Ernest Holmes says that 
this would be no different from saying that if you wish a harvest, you must first plant it. You must plant the idea in creative soil. Shifting this over, he says, because we're using this soil and dirt metaphor. He says, but when you shift this over to what the field of mind, and I'm pointing to my head, but that's, when I, that's not where mind is. That's where the brain is. And the brain is not the same as mind. So to the field of mind, out of which everything emanates. He says, we arrive at the conclusion that the idea must be accepted as an already accomplished fact. This is this notion that I'm reinforcing about time, that there's no season of time, and it can only operate on the concept that it's held in. He says, the seed must be left in the creative soil of mind until it can mature. So the time for that, nobody knows. There is a time for sowing as well as a time for harvest. Plants must not be pulled up or interrupted in the process of their growth. So it is with your ideas. I know sometimes we get tired of it. I've been waiting on that. That ain't happened. I, when I had a practitioner in coaching practice, if I had money, more money, but every time somebody said, I already did that. And I just learned to fix my face. <laughs> because I realized in that moment that there was a misunderstanding about time. Because some stuff you just have to keep on doing till there ain't no doing to be done. And it's not, there's never a moment where, where we can stand in, I already did that. Because it's just, I mean, what do you say? But then you're excused. You know, already prayed. Let me get out your way. But the idea here is that we are not to interrupt the process. We got to trust it first. I think that's just, that's assumed here. That you'll trust the process enough to not interrupt it. To, to, to you not think you're in charge of time. <laughs> ring the bell. It's, um, that's enough. That's enough trusting. That's enough believing. I've been believing since January. <laughs> you know, you just pull the plug on that. I've had faith since last week. <laughs> that's enough. But instead, we are, Ernest Holmes offers us that we are, we're to water these seeds with hope. And we're to fertilize them with expectancy. I love that. Yes. And cultivate it with enthusiasm. Y'all better get some. Cultivate it with enthusiasm. Bring your sense of spirit to it, your energy and gratitude and joyous recognition. Bottom line, you got work to do. This is not you just out of firm and stuff. This is you in a consciousness, in a mindset, in a physical uh, attitude of. Yes. And, and so much so that you can't be moved from that. It doesn't matter what's going on and what, what other folks are saying and what they're doing. Because what? I'm standing in this awareness. I got seeds that I have planted that I'm tending to. I can't go with you. Not, I don't mean go with you physically, but I can't follow your thinking. Because that's poisoning my seeds. I have planted some stuff that I'm responsible for, that I believe in, and I must tend to it. And my tending to it is at the mental, emotional, and spiritual level. How else could you be? What did he say? Water it with hope. You better be. Fertilizing it with expectancy. Cultivating it with enthusiasm. You best be there. Nurturing in that way. He said with cultivating it also with gratitude and joyous recognition. Come on, Ernest Holmes. 
Yes. You know, we, we spent our summer, and now we're in fall, and just peep, we're going to go on into the new year with the four pivots. We're going to ride it to the wheels for a lot. Because it's good. Because it's helping us. Because we're benefiting from it, yes? Well, if it isn't, we're going to stop. Is it? Oh, okay. I thought it was, based on what y'all say. But in that moment, you were acting like I'm out here on my own. So if we're going to practice it in community, then we're going to have to be in community and acknowledge that it's worthwhile. Is it? All right. I, th- I thought so. I just needed to get clear in each moment around that. Because, you know, our first pivot brings us to a point of awareness where we, where we move from the lens where we become the expert on everybody and everything. And instead, we get more familiar with the mirror where we see ourselves. A self-awareness is essential in this practice. And then the second pivot is about connection, where we move from transactional to transformational relationships. It's about the connection in this. And then the third pivot is vision, where we begin to reimagine. And very much what I'm talking about today has to do with this third pivot of vision, where we begin by shifting and reimagining how we think and we act and we shift from problem fixing, and some would say loving, problem loving, where we just focus totally on the problem and instead shift it to possibility creating. Where something's up, we're looking for not how wrong is it and how much of an expert can I be on how wrong it is and how it doesn't work, but can I instead live in the universe of the infinite possibility around what could happen with this? Our leadership circle had a retreat uh, couple of week couple of three weeks ago I think now it's been and that's where we that's where we sat that's just where we we steeped ourselves in this notion of possibility it was rich because so often we find ourselves in whatever our situation is and we've made up that that's just how it is well we can't do that because we don't do that that's just not how it's done I've never been nowhere where that was done that way and so it is, exactly. But that's not, and so we, we really gave ourselves permission to lean into some possibilities that we've never considered. It's, you know, it's, it's as energizing as it is a little scary. And that little combination is where stuff happens. You know, because if you just like, come, well, yeah, I got that. Well, it ain't nothing much going to be different because you already got that. But if you're right there on the edge, if you just right, and some of us are like, that's where the stuff happens. You know, when I'm out here because now I'm, I'm working on whatever it is I have to work on to, to move me forward. When that's not necessarily what I would have chosen for myself for the ease of it. This is a good time. And sometimes, sometimes it's not until it's a really difficult time that we can really have a good time. I I don't know if y'all really understand. I don't know if y'all are really willing to acknowledge that sometimes we don't even, we're not even willing to have a really good time until after we acknowledge that this ain't the time. This This ain't the time I'm willing to have. It's in that moment that the greater possibility that we're willing to what? See a new heaven. Because this ain't, this ain't doing. <laughs> so rather than just be the expert on what all I'm not doing, I'm going to see a new heaven. A new possibility. And I keep pointing up because heaven is not a place. I need to be clear about that. I'm pointing up because I lift up mine eyes unto the hills. It's, it's an upward look. It's a greater possibility than what's right here at the current vista. Yes. Okay. All right. So look. 
this fourth pivot. It's the one. Because we are a spiritual community, we know in the words of my mother, what's at our bread is buttered up. We know that the place to begin is in the presence, in our awareness of the divine presence, the living one, the strong one, the all in all, by any name. And so when we look at pivot number four, which Dr. Sean Jin Wright calls presence appropriately, it's moving from this energy of hustle, the frenetic energy of I got to get it done, it's up to me, I got to keep busy, that that's how I validate self, that's how I, that's how I identify who I am and how I am by how busy I am. And instead, he says, to find a calmer, gentler, more productive flow state. Oh. Ernest Holmes, you know, I love blending stuff. So look, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, you know, I just, I want to cut, you know, like if it was a piece of paper, I want to cut just a little divot and slide, and then fit Ernest Holmes in there with this idea that Dr. Sean brought us. Yes, so look, Ernest Holmes says, disregarding the softness and beauty of the words of Jesus, the master teacher. Look at here. Can I just say this? That so often we get a picture painted of the, of the master teacher that the world, uh, Yeshua, that the world ultimately came to call Jesus, that is meek and mild. And we miss the revolutionary. We miss the one that was in the cut, transforming folks' thinking. We miss how he stood and spoke love to power. We missed the courage, the bodaciousness just bolder than anybody else to stand and say who and whose he is. And simultaneously at the same time, there is this gentleness, this softness, this in his words, in, his, in the ministry, in the teaching. Does that make sense? What he taught was the operation of a law of cause and effect. He said that not one jot or tittle of it can be changed. All the poetry, the wit, the knowledge, the art of the angels cannot alter the fact that love alone begets love. Peace alone attracts peace, that only that which goes forth in joy can return with gladness, give, and to you shall be given good measure, pressed down and running over. There, there, there's so much guidance that if, we, if we're still enough to, to tune in, to, to um, develop a divine listening, that we can be guided in this. Ernest Holmes says, you need not force or coerce, but you must obey the law. If you can see the divine in everything, the living one, the strong one, God, Father Almighty, by any name, then it is looking back at you through everything. Oh, but you got to know it. I mean, you got to know it at a level that I tend to say that if you were awakened out of a deep sleep and asked about it, you'd be clear. It's knowing it at that level, like you, like you know your own name. Yes. That there's, that there's no separation, that there's no confusion about it. 
when the time comes that nothing goes forth from you other than that which you would be glad to have returned? I don't know if y'all heard that. It's hard to say. It's hard to say because this is not a mountaintop ministry. This is not a mountaintop teaching. Y'all don't catch me at the top of the mountain with a megaphone hollering down to y'all little people. (laughs) This is instead, most often y'all see me in the valley. How you see me in the valley? Because we's in the valley together. And it's just that, you know, something has touched me to say something right here in the valley. (laughs) And I know, and I just appreciate that y'all don't look over and say, what you doing here in the valley? I thought you knew. Thank you. I just want to thank you for for not just calling me out because I be in the valley a lot. Working it out. Yes? Yes. So this idea here, he says that when the time comes, when you time not on the clock, not on the calendar, but at the moment when you're willing, at the moment when you won't have it any other way, in the moment when you don't care what has happened already or what you fear might be going to happen, in that moment when it all comes together for you where there is no other time or option, at that moment <laughs> when you know that nothing, will co- nothing comes forth from you other than that which you would be glad to have returned, In that moment, when there's not a word that you say, there's not a thought that you think, there's not a look that you give, that you are not asking for yourself. It's hard to hear. It's hard to say. I kind of want to fix it. I want this part of me to kind of want, well, not, not, not everything he said. Just, you know, just do the part you can. <laughs> Cut it into a bite-sized piece. No! Get in the deep end and be willing to, to shift how we're thinking, how we're sensing, how we're being with each other, with ourselves and each other. Because, you know, mirror work. Yeah. Where we begin to really get with ourselves about how we be and be willing to shift that on some level. He says when we're willing to do that, when we're willing to have nothing go forth from us, no idea, no word, no look, no innuendo, no nothing that we wouldn't want, I'm going to add, to present publicly. There's a part of me that just wants to go sit down and journal. <laughs> could, could you excuse me, please? Because <laughs> I got a little clearing to do. <laughs> Ooh. These moments can be tough moments for me to be teaching what I'm learning. And that's what you've signed up for as a teacher who is in the midst of transforming her life. Right here before you on mic. So look, this moving from hustle to flow from doing it ourselves from the most egoic place, not the divine I amness of the shift. Yes. And with the intention of finding, claiming, realizing, embracing a calmer, gentler, and more productive flow state. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. From there, from a flow state, Thank you. I am still, um, I can still hear flow. In my heart, there's a love that's ready to flow. Can you come go there with me? 
to just in this moment be willing to acknowledge, honor, feel, realize, recognize that in your heart, in the divine heart of God that each of us experiences, not, not the muscle in, the ca- in your chest cavity, in my heart there's a love that's ready to flow. Sense that now. Acknowledge that. Be with that. Today's prayer that I think I'm sharing with you today is from a couple of treatments from um, Dr. Frank Richelieu. In my heart, there's a love that's ready to flow. And it's time to let it. The world needs, wants, I, we need, want the love in our heart to flow and be the impetus for everything, the inspiration. What I know for sure is that there is only one power and it's love. And that each and every one of us is in tune in his and her and their own way. The power of love. I am in perfect alignment with this one power. I am one with and as this power. I am in perfect alignment with this one power. I am as God is. I and the Father be one. This one power running through me as me now is in every fiber of my being. And this is true for each and every one of us. I see with the eyes of love. I hear with the ears of love. I exist in love and am of love. I love so deep and so strong. As I recognize nothing but love at all times, I know that I attract nothing but love and loving experiences and events. I insist upon seeing love in all things. Love is the reality behind all seeming discord. There is an orderly operation taking place in me. And in all of us, from the smallest cell and the smallest atom to the largest organ that is in me, in us, it is a part of a divine blueprint. Nothing, absolutely nothing can be out of place. Everything about the real me is whole, is perfect, is complete. Nothing can mar the real me. Nothing can congest the real me. The real me needs no improving upon. It already is. It is complete in every way. This is our shared truth. The real me is the life force of creativity that is in me. There is a divine plan and the blueprint in me is unfolding. No matter what takes place in the outer, the inner is pure and untouched, renewed always and in all ways. The intelligence that keeps the whole universe in perfect operation is the same intelligence that is operating in and through me. I am wonderfully made. We are wonderfully made magnificent to behold, a joy to experience. For I am, we are the glory of God made manifest. God, the living one, the strong one who fashioned me out of itself, enjoys seeing me, us, as itself. This is my beloved in whom 
whom I am well pleased. I am the living one, the strong one, in divine action. So in gratitude and thanksgiving for this truth, I accept the beauty of life and the joyous nature of the Spirit and the divine fragrance of love everywhere, always present. With a grateful heart, I release this word into the perfect activity of law. I accept it as so, now and forevermore. I seal this for all eternity by saying, Ashe, Amen, and so it is. Yes, yes, love matters.